Good morning. Thanks for waking up this early. Um, my name is Nikolai Georgescu. Um, I work in Gameloft for the past 11 years. The past seven years in uh, synchronizing real-time multiplayer and uh, online security. I'm going to talk about how to handle security in your game. We're going to go through some uh, do's and don'ts we learned in Gameloft. And uh, towards the end, uh, we're going to talk a bit about uh, multiplayer. Um, the, sh the scenario I have in mind is uh, you launch the game, it became successful, and very soon after, a lot of hacks come in. And uh, they can affect the community, and of course, monetization. Um, there are examples of games that, that went down for this reason. Gameloft's way for uh, this was better safe than sorry. And it makes sense, because once you launched a game, and uh, while develop if you didn't have security in mind while developing the game, after it's launched, it's unlikely you're going to be able to add security in a fast update. So you're probably not going to be able to solve this solution, this problem. Gameloft had a few games that, uh, that uh, failed for this reason. So better safe than sorry was the, was the thought, the strategy. Uh, one, uh, we're going to look at one example. Pastry Paradise was in development at that time. It's a pretty common game. You have multiple levels, and in each level, the gameplay is swiping um, items of the same type. You group them together, they collapse, and you make points. It's similar to other games. I can't remember their names right now. Um, the team argued that it's a casual game, and they should uh, go going to full online and security is not, uh, is not needed. But uh, the top, top management said, full no-go. You must be fully server authoritative. So this was the only game of this type on the market with full online and security. Isn't this great? It turns out, no, not really. Uh, the users didn't really see the benefit in it. They were used to, to playing, going in the subway or losing internet, continue to play your, your puzzle, when you get the internet back, you get to see your friend's score. Simple. They didn't really understand why we're asking for a mandatory connection in order for you to solve your puzzle. Uh, more than this, the team was not granted enough time to implement security, so there were a lot of waiting for server moments in, uh, during the gameplay, and it, it really messed the, the experience. All in all, it was, uh, it was a failure. So, if uh, better safe than sorry doesn't work all the time, what does? And we're going to talk about how to determine the security model you really need. For this, let's, let's uh, look at the mindset first. I'm going to give another example. We had a racer game a few years back. It was doing quite well. It had real-time multiplayer race, racing. And um, the um, company wanted to boost the, the number of players and organized a wanted to organize a tournament, uh, with, but this time the prize would be a real car. The um, game was uh, evaluated, if it's safe or not. Uh, community was checked, uh, complaints, hacks on different websites, and nothing was found for multiplayer, so the game was considered safe. The tournament was announced, and one day later, a leaderboard was full of people finishing the races in 0 0.01 seconds, some even negative scores. That was a bit interesting. So the conclusion, the, the mindset, it's not about how secure your game is. It's about how badly someone wants to hack it. This is important. This is the mindset we, we have. Going back to, to Pastry Paradise, player versus player interaction is there is pretty low. You only see your friend's scores. That's all. So if your friend if your friend hacks and you see him like top score on all the missions, you can even text him. It's, he's your Facebook friend. Or if he hacks to an unreasonable uh, score, a simple filter on the database is going to ban his account. And banning the account with the Facebook means he's not going to, even if he starts over, he's not going to have the Facebook friend. So he's, nobody's going to notice, basically. There's no big reward into hacking a game like that. On the other end lies real time multiplayer. In a first-person shooter, if you manage to, to speed hack and melee kill everybody on the map, that's, that can be fun or frustrating, depending on, on which side of the weapon you are. 
if you if you add um, tournaments with uh, with prizes in real money, you're attracting the the most uh, the most heat. So, this is the mindset. Let's look at some uh, some of the common uh, common hacks uh, very shortly. Uh, time hacks are probably the most common. Uh, changing the the date, changing the time. Now there are also apps that that make your the time on your device run faster, fast forward. Um, Using monotonic time to check this is a CPU time to, to check the difference with the with the clock time is probably going to going to help. Another very used uh, hack is memory tools. You install an application, you write a value in it, the value of your uh, currency. Uh, the application is going to search in the memory and replace it with the new value, more currency. For this, you should keep your sensitive data in multiple locations and multiple formats. Less common is man in the middle when someone hacks the packet. Um, encryption is probably going to solve most of these cases. And last but not least, client code hacks. Now, for this, you must be server authoritative. Because if the client code is hacked, and instead of saying, I died, it's saying, I killed everybody, there's no point in, in encrypting this data because encryption comes after the hack. So the client cannot, can only say what it wants to do. The server decides. As a short sum up, we have uh, security design models. So when, in, if a game is client authoritative, you're going to go with the, with the time hacks, with the memory debug tools. This, these are your, your tools. For server authoritative, the client cannot post to leaderboards. It cannot upload its own progress. It cannot uh, decide who to attack. It cannot uh, decide in a, in a real time multiplayer. It cannot decide if he won or if he killed or if he gave damage. It only tells the server that he wants to do something, and the server decides. Now, between these two, producers especially asked what's in between. So let's say there's a middle way. We implemented this. Going a bit in more detail, middle way is not something wow. Middle way means part of the game is client authoritative and part is server authoritative. Basically, you're saying you can hack this part, but you cannot hack this part. Um, a good example for this is a game with multiple currencies. Let's say you have a soft currency that you can easily get from playing, and you have a hard currency that you can hardly get from, from playing the game, and you mostly get it from, from uh, buying with real money. And it makes sense to say, okay, we're going we're gonna to let the, the player do whatever with soft currency, but if he wants hard currency, he needs to, to really pay and, and check, have, have all the, the actions based on hard currency, verified with a server. Um, looking at an example, um, the thing is designers are going to come up with, with all sorts of ideas about, uh, about this. And um, they're going to get bored with, with uh, playing with soft currency very fast because nobody really wants it, right? So um, they're going to want to award hard currency in all kinds of weird, wa weird ways. One of them is uh, one example is awarding hard currency 10% of the time the user finishes a mission. In a client authoritative solution, you probably have an uh, on mission end method somewhere. You just add a random if it's a 10%, and if it is, display congrats, you got hard currency, and add 10 hard currency or whatever. But if you want security on this, you can't do this on the client. You're going to need to have everything related to hard currency in a different part of the profile that only the server can write add, subtract, and you're going to need to run a script that is server-side. Only you or someone who hacks in the data center can modify. The script is going to look something like this. Um, again, the random check, it's going to add the hard currency to the profile, to the part of the profile that is secure, and it's going to tell the client, you got it. Now, it doesn't matter if the client will consider that he didn't get it, because in the profile, it's never going to be, be there. Now, this is missing something. Uh, it's missing a quantitative check. Basically, a hacker is going to just call this 10,000 times. The script is not going to know. It's a, it's a stateless script. It's not going to know it's being called 10,000 times. So you're going to need to save something, uh, get mission time profile. It's, it's some quantitative data, like uh, when was the last time awarded or the missions that were awarded with, with hard currency. So you're going to need to check this is not being abusively called. Now, looking at this, 
uh, this means two hits to the database and calling the script for every user on every single mission end. You need a web server to run the script, and you need machines to run the web server and the scripts. So the next question is, how many machines do you need? You don't want to launch your game and then have it fail because you didn't have enough machines. Whether you're buying them or you're renting them, you still need to know. The solution is to um, simulate, to write some, some bot scripts that simulate client actions. You figure out a way, a, a number of users you expect in the first part of uh, launching. You run them and see how many server it requires. And uh, you make sure you have that amount of, of machines on launch. So all of this, I mean, we started from a five-minute implementation on the client authoritative. You just added a check on 10% on and the currency. And we ended up with this, with web servers, uh, stress tests, and all of this, which is considerably more work to do. Uh, sure, some people are going to say we don't need to go this much in detail. We can simplify by, for example, not calling the script on every mission end, but uh, having a capping per day. Like, um, you can award this amount of hard currency per day, and you're not going to check on every mission. Yes, this is a capping. It, it's a good trade-off. You're going to lower the number of resources you, your server needs. But the flow is still the same. You're going to need to do all the, all the tasks anyway. So in conclusion, middleware security, it has a good part. It allows some offline play. You're going to be able to play. You're going to get only soft currency. Whenever you need to get hard currency, you have it secure. So this is a good part. The bad part, it adds a lot of development time for the security. And design-wise, it becomes very complex. It's like having two different games. We had this in uh, Brothers in Arms 3, uh, released about a year and a half ago. And the game was initially released only with single player. It supported offline. And then we wanted to add multi real-time multiplayer uh, first-person shooter in, uh, in an update. The real-time multiplayer part needed to be secure. But it's not enough to secure um, collision checks, bullets, and everything like this if the player's inventory is hacked. Because all the hackers are going to come with the coolest possible weapon. The server is going to check, OK, they hit and they made a lot of damage. But it doesn't help. So we need to secure the part of the inventory as well. And what this meant, for multiplayer, we had different currencies, different weapons, and different weapon upgrades. It's basically two games in one. Single player, you had one set of weapons and, and currencies. Multiplayer, you had something completely different. And, and this is more complex than, than, um, than we initially thought. We're not really looking into doing this anytime soon. Um, the next topic, the second part of the presentation, is about um, real-time multiplayer on mobile. Uh, it's pretty different than, uh, than what we've talked so far. It's about a 10-minute talk. Um, I think we have time. If anyone has a question on the first part, we can, we can have it now, because you're probably going to forget. No questions? Good. I'm going to continue. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, some of the differences in um, that different things we implemented for real-time multiplayer. We're going to look at the uh, first-person shooter game. Uh, different things uh, from the classical model on the PC games, which is documented on the market for many years now. Um, this is a video. Okay, so this is, these are videos posted by actual users. That's why the resolution is not great. Uh, they post it on, on our community wall. This is how Modern Combat 5 real-time multiplayer looks like. Uh, we're proud of it. <laughs> um, as, an, uh, as a general uh, overview, one, one very important thing to know 
is wireless connection is worse than cable connection. Of course, everybody knows that, but how, worse, how, how bad is it and in what ways? Uh, network delay varies a lot more, which means sending packets from here to, to your server can vary a lot depending on, on literally if someone opens the door between you and the hotspot. More no wind or whatever, more noise is coming in. A lot of packets are going to be dropped because of the extra noise, and the bandwidth is going to be renegotiated, and this adds delay. Um, besides this, uh, when the hotspot is overcrowded, a lot of players are, uh, are accessing it. Again, it's going to add delay. Um, a 30 milliseconds uh, time between you and the hotspot is something pretty normal. Uh, if, we, if we think about 30 milliseconds, on cable, you can get a message from here to some cities in Germany, which is, let's say, 2,000 kilometers away. So it is a difference. The other difference is um, high message frequency can induce more loss. Uh, if you have a lot of players on the hotspot, or, or some of them are sending 20, 30, 40 messages per second, it can add more loss uh, on, some of the, um, on some of the hotspots. On cable, you don't have this problem. High, high message frequency only, only counts as the extra uh, bandwidth used for the, for the header of the messages. There is no other cost related to it. Synchronizing FPS multiplayer, what we tried differently than classic models. Um, we've done uh, six, seven uh, shooters in the past six or seven years uh, in Bucharest. Um, each of them had some particularities, some things we did slightly different. As a general overview, um, the recommended reading from, uh, from that helped us a lot is the Gaffron Games blog and the Valve Engine uh, source and documentation. UDP with reliability implemented, uh, custom implemented is no doubt the, the solution. And uh, Star Network, all players connected to a dedicated server that decides everything for security. This is, again, um, the only choice. So let's look at some, some of, the, of the actions and, and how they're handled. Movement. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on uh, synchronizing the movement of, of my player with the server, because this is where we, we went a bit different. So the classic model says, the client should send actions to the server. I press forward, I press backwards, I press this. And the server, the, the client is going gonna, is gonna to start moving on the spot, but as a simulation. The server is going to move the, the client's object based on this input, and it's going to tell the client back, you are here, you are here. The client is going to correct itself based on what the server says. So, in however order the messages get to the server or delay, that's how the player is going to be moving. It doesn't matter what the client simulates. Um, the other way of, uh, of doing this is sending positions from the client to the server and making the client authoritative for this. This is like uh, every, this is the a player's trajectory. Uh, and each, each uh, rectangle is a message that is received with, with a position and time. What this means, together with the, with the render delay, uh, render delay is when I receive the first message, I don't do anything. Uh, even if there is a network delay till I receive the first message, I'm going to add an extra render delay. And I'm only going to do something but when I receive the second or third message, which means if a message is lost, for example, second message is lost. By the time I need to, to render, to, to update the player for, for this time, I'm al already going to have the next one or two messages. So I know where the pl player is heading. You can easily even linear interpolate. And you're going to be able to get, with interpolation, you're going to be able to, to reproduce the almost exact same trajectory. So even with a 30% packet loss, these are four messages lost out of 12, you, the server can simulate almost identical client trajectory. Whereas with sending actions, if you lose one of the actions, like I'm moving forward, no matter what, you're going to have a difference between what the server, where the server thinks the player is and where the client thinks. 
Now, we went this way because we were worried with actions, the player is going to get corrected too many times and you're going to because of the network issues and you're going to lose player immersion. You're going to feel that your player is not yourself because you're going to get moved away uh, too often. Now, this sounds great, so we have better resilience uh, to, to packet loss, but, but what, was, uh, what was Valve thinking? Why didn't they want this? They were thinking security. Um, about, I mean, we also thought it's a security issue because the client is basically telling you where it is. So it can, the client can abuse this. We thought about it. Um, we didn't think it's going to get hacked that fast. It was a matter of days that the client code was hacked and it was sending up uh, very, very uh, high move, movement speeds. So what we did was um, adding, of course, the client sends the positions, but the server can check everything, right? The server runs all the world and all the players. So in, in a conclusion, if the client sends actions and, auto -cor and corrects itself based on what the server says, it's the highest security. It's the highest security because, generally speaking, for actions, it's, you cannot hack that much. When client sends position, positions and it's authoritative on his position, it's a lower security. Why? Because let's say the server uh, checks, okay, you're sending uh, these positions, and I'm going to deduct the speed out of those positions. And I can say, okay, the maximum normal speed is 30 kilometers per hour for the ru fastest running uh, class. You're going to add a small threshold of 5 10%, let's say 33 kilometers per hour, to avoid ever banning uh, or kicking an honest user. And you're going to run these checks. Now, very soon after, you're going to find out that uh, just having one number is not enough because uh, you have different classes, different perks, different weapons. A uh, heavy class with a heavy weapon and no perks has a top speed of 15 kilometers per hour. So you're going to need to add a threshold for every single part of this, uh, all these possibilities, let's say. Radu knows exactly that it's, an, it's, not, a, it's not a nice code to, to write and to maintain but it works. However, you're not going to be able to reduce the 5-10% um, threshold where hacks can happen. It's not, it's not very bad, but you do get higher resilience to packet loss. The player is not going to jump itself just because something got lost between him and the server. Which one to choose? Um, well, the good news is you can implement both and switch between them server side. With a bit of um, development time and bandwidth, you can have the client send both actions and positions and have the server decide what it wants to do. It can trust the client on the positions. It can also, by this, it can, it can verify if the client is close to what the server says. You can have stats on, on uh, how big are the network issues, how much player experience would be affected. And if you have a problem with, with, the, with the threshold, you can even flip the switch and the server is going to start running only based on its, its own simulation. The client can hack whatever it wants. The server is not going gonna, not gonna to believe it. Um, so you can implement them and see how it works f for your game. Uh, this is a thing that you, you're going to find out more after your game is launched. Um, during testing, you're not going to be, be able to really testing all the networks, all the areas. You're not going to get uh, this valuable data unless your game is live. Um, the next action, the last action, is shooting. Shooting requires um, a separate management because by the time I, uh, the client sends, I shoot, by the time this message reaches the server, some time had already passed. So the server receives the message, knows the client shot at time t. It, it needs, the server needs to roll back all the world and all the entities in the world to that time. So basically, the server is going to try to roll back and have recreate as much as possible the exact same picture that the client was seeing when it shot. So the server can run, start the bullet and see if there's any collision or not decision of, of collision with when any player is taken server side. 
But then again, we, we have a problem with, um, with uh, network issues and what they can mean. Because even a slight difference between where the client is aiming and where the server has the client synchronized as aiming, even a difference of one degree between them, over 50 meters, it can mean up to one meter. And this is a huge difference, right? So tiny one degree be, um, desynchronization uh, can, can lead in, in a lot of, a lot of uh, issues. So in conclusion, client sending just I press shoot and server runs the bullet from the position and with the aim direction it has on the server is high security. One of the examples is there is no weapon recoil hack. The client can, can hack itself and have no, no recoil on the weapon, but that doesn't mean anything because the server is going to run the bullet out of a weapon that has recoil. You, th you may think you managed to hack the client, but actually it has no effect whatsoever. This is because you're sending an action, just I shoot. The same for, for uh, no reload uh, hack. We, we had all these hacks, that's why we didn't invent them. Um, no reload uh, hack. The client can, can send uh, I shoot with a higher frequency than the weapon can with, without sending reloading. It's not going to have any, any impact because the server is going to run, uh, is going to actually start bullets based on what the weapon can really do. And if it's reloading, it's going to reload and ignore the, the I shoot messages. The problem is it leaves more room for error. And just as I said, with the slight one degree difference or differences in time synchronization of 10 milliseconds, which are pretty small, you can get uh, 10, 20 centimeters error, maybe more, depending on the distance and the uh, movement of players. So these mean that even if the client aimed correctly, the server is not going to confirm the hit. And this is not something that we want to happen too often. What we can do about it, and we did it in the, in the first implementation, client can send more data. It can send his position when firing. It can send the position of the, of the barrel of the gun in case there is a slight desynchronization between a crouch animation and standing. I mean, you're on the same position on the map, but you're starting the bullet from a different point. It can send its aim direction, and why not? It, it can even send if it hit someone or not for, for, um, for very fast speed uh, bullets. Now, the good part is the server can do whatever it wants with them. It can, it can um, accept everything within a threshold. So if the client said it was here, and I have it two centimeters more to the right, and a difference between aim of 0 0.5 degrees, I'm going to trust the client because I'm going to consider that this error is within the threshold. I'm going to let the client, uh, let the client have the best experience. Uh, but this means a lower security. Why? Because even at 10, 20 centimeters can mean a hacker sending, I mean, very careful engineering, some, some hacks is going to, to have like heads of their opponents 10, 20 centimeters larger. So it is a hack. Now, the good part is you're going to, I mean, of course, it's a better player experience because the correct hits will be confirmed for honest users. But your, your fallback, in, in case this uh, goes the, the wrong way, you can flip the switch whenever you want on the server. So you're just going to say, OK, you can send me this data if you hit someone or not, but I'm just going to ignore it. And I'm going to run the bullet on whatever I server think it's, it's running. So basically. As for moving and shooting, you can have kind of like a, a slider bar between best experience and best anti-hack. And there's no one solution fits all here. You really need to, to test this and see how it works out for, for your game. Because you can always check how it works by, by validating. I mean, if the client sends this data, you know exactly how off clients usually are. You can have tracking based on, on hotspots and different network conditions. You're going to say, OK, these players in US have a good experience. This is the biggest market. I can afford to, to flip the switch for higher security because it's going to work for them. If you have only one data center and you have players from China connecting to, to your server in North America, it's not going to work for them. So it also depends on how 
geolocated you, you are with your, with your game servers. So it depends on a lot of things. But the main idea is because of the network conditions that are lower than on cable, you probably want, I mean, we wanted to have the, the possibility to, to tune in between security and, and experience. Uh, we're still working on this. I mean, it's not a thing that you finish in a day or a week or three months because there's a lot of, of tweaking to do. In conclusion about multiplayer, implementing the standard model for security is a lot of work. It's all about synchronizing the time, rolling back on the server to get what the client sees, interpolating everything that, that is in the, in the normal model. Um, it's, it takes time because you need the server to run very well, no crashes, very good player experience. You also need to tweak it for your game engine and design. This is more work, and even though the um, the model for the, the standard model, for example, on Valve, is is documented on the internet for more than six years for sure. You still have big companies like, for example, Overwatch uh, posted a video on their uh, or on their tweaks on synchronizing real-time multiplayer uh, earlier this year. They were talking about how they were managing um, delays and not going not rolling back for too long in case of some hacks or some problems that can occur in there. Um, and also on their hit detect precision. Uh, you have MechWarrior team that uh, is talking about how they tweaked their um, low speed uh, projectiles and synchronize them. So, I mean, even though the, the general data is long uh, time uh, on the market, you still have big companies finding ways to tweak their on, based on what they really have. So this is, this is uh, more work to do. And finally, finding the right balance between security and experience on your game is also more work. So um, reaching to a conclusion, what I said in the beginning that if you designed and you launched your game without having security in mind, adding all this in a, in a hotfix this is not going to work. I mean, roughly, we're talking between six months and a year, and even after you launch, you're going to still be tweaking it in, in the updates. You can't release this in a, in a one week or one month hotfix hot to, to solve the, the security issues. It's the same for that, for that script on the 10% of the time award uh, hard currency on, on uh, mission end. You can't add, add it just like that. So you kind of need to have it before because it's a lot of work to do. Um, this was all I had to, to talk about. If, uh, thank you for, for listening. If you have any questions. <laughs> please. Uh, do you have a report system for uh, when a user feels there's a hacker in game? And do you store data about uh, every game and analyze it to report, uh, to yeah. confirm yes. and ban users? Yes. Well, the report feature was, uh, was uh, added some time ago. The problem with, with uh, reporting uh, hacks on a first-person shooter is whenever someone dies and he thought it sh he shouldn't die, he's going to report a hack. Now, if you remember uh, some time ago, we were playing uh, Counter-Strike in an um, in, uh, internet cafe or something like this with a dedicated server. While people were playing, it doesn't matter who was playing, they were always saying, I killed you first. This, this server didn't confirm correctly. I mean, these are, let's say, player frustrations. There, there's a lot of that. So what we're doing, we're analyzing the data on the server, and we're going to we're going to check the differences between what the server says and what the client says and see if we have differences in there. Because you can't really trust the client if he thinks it's, it's a hack or not. You, of course, in uh, general numbers, if you have one million complaints on this, you have a problem and you need to dig, dig deeper. But if you have, let's say, a steady kind of normal level of complaints, checking the, the, your own data is, is more accurate. Kind of automatically. <laughs> um, we do have uh, the ability to, s since you need to connect to our own dedicated server when you play, 
Uh, and this de dedicated server can store data about your playing experience. It can store, you speed hack once, you speed hack twice, I'm going to ban you. You have two big differences in aim direction or other actions once, twice, ten times, depending on thresholds that we're continuously uh, modifying. And we can take a decision to ban. Sometimes, I mean, for a speed hack, you can ban a player in a few seconds if he speeds hack with a huge value. If he gets from point A to point B with twice the speed that it's normal, is, he's hacked. He's, he's kicked in less than three seconds. For others, it takes more time to, to analyze the data. So if it's fully automatic, no. But we're moving towards that, that uh, approach. Because obviously, for a lot of players, you can't take every single one of them and say, OK, I'm going to trust you or not. No. No. Uh, we have a voting system to choose the next map, but uh, not to kick players because it could easily be abused, right? I'm going to have another three friends in, my, in the game, and I'm not liking you because you kill everybody. You're gone. So, yeah. So, Hi. nice presentation, and uh, I have two questions. Uh, can you share more about the server, uh, how many servers you have on, in what regions of the world? Well, um, we used to have only one region, and that was North America, but it doesn't, it doesn't uh, give the experience you really need. So we had a lot of complaints, and uh, I'm not sure if I can say exactly the regions where we have, but let's say we have also in Asia. Um, it depends on your market. If you have a big market in China, you're going to need to go to China if the players in there are, are uh, complaining. It's basically based on, on monitoring the community. It's not something you, you unless you have an, uh, an unreasonable amount of money and you say, okay, I'm going to take data centers everywhere just in case, you, sh you can also test the community or, or how other games do. So what I can say is China, if you are interested in there, because of the great firewall of China, as we call it, uh, it's not going to work with something outside. Okay, so I then assume that since you don't have servers all over the world, uh, the game must cope with the huge amounts of lag. Yeah. What's the maximum, uh, I don't know, ping time or... Well... We round trip time started for, with, uh, we can cope with. We started. It's, it's a very good question. We started with allowing up to 500 round ping time, round trip time. Uh, the game works because you can. I mean, this is a de delay on the network. You add a render delay. Everything looks looks perfectly. They they move right with the interpolation and everything. But the problem is, you would get killed after you crossed a corner by someone who doesn't see you at the moment you died, because on his device, he still sees you. And this is frustrating. This is, um, at some point, this was the biggest, the biggest complaint, or top three biggest complaints of our users. So we had to, to go to other regions, yes. Now, um, whether you have your own data center or you're renting, it's up to your business model. Um, big companies offer data centers in many regions. Um, what you want to, to check in there is replicating the, um, the data between, between databases because you need to store player pre player's profile, inventory, weapons, and you need for your dedicated game server to get them kind of fast. Now, if you have only one database or you have them in multiple locations, you're either adding some delay when accessing from a dedicated servers from multiple locations to the same database or if you have multiple databases, you're either splitting the community or you have to replicate the data between these databases. So replication uh, worldwide is not really solved right now in a cost-efficient way. So again, it, it depends on your budget. I guess if you have a super well-played game, you're going you're gonna to have the money for that too. OK, and last one, I promise. What's the server tick rate? The server tick rate, we changed that as well. Um, but we started from something like 2025. And uh, I think we're not more than 30. Um, the reason is 
you also want to, I mean, you need to fine tune between the experience you get and the money you pay for the servers. Because if you have, a, uh, let's say, a 60 tick rate, and you're going to run simulations for every single bullet, roll back, run the physics, run check collisions at a 60 tick rate, you're going to use more CPU, right? So you need to check what's, what's the right amount for your game. And if you actually get an increase in, in player experience from going from 30 tick rates to 60 tick rates. Because you might or you might not. It also depends on the frequency you're sending messages with. Because if you're sending messages with only 20, 25 messages per second, you're not going to get much more from the 60 tick rate. On the other hand, you can have a higher, I mean, you can have a, a 20, 30 general tick rate. But when you're rolling back and running a bullet, you can have a higher tick rate depending on the weapon, depending on whatever um, game-specific uh, design. Because what you want is to offer the best experience and, and confirm a hit when you should confirm one. So you, you can, you can fine-tune these, these depending on your game. Thank you. Hi there, and thanks Hi. for presenting. Um, as I understand, flipping the switch is a per-server feature. Um, do you also have, for a location, some servers with the switch on and some with the switch off where trusted clients can uh, log? Well, you can do that as long as you have the switch. I mean, you can switch it to, for example, if you're, if you're um, running tournaments with, uh, with awards in, in, actual, in real money, you can flip the switch for those games, sure. And are you using that... Uh, Currently, <laughs> I I can't say because um, we're actually having a lot of uh, a lot of hacks coming in, so um, we're working on on. Uh, I mean, right now we're not. We want to detect some of the hacks faster than we're doing it, um, because um, I mean, even if the the game is released uh, for two years now, and we got some serious hacks three months ago, so it's. Whenever someone starts hating us, they're going to they're gonna do their best. So uh, it's not like if you went past the first three months, you're in the clear. Nobody's going to hack. No. So uh, it's, you, you need to tune it based on the community, the hacks. If someone is, is, is selling a hack for a lot of money because the hack is actually doing something, it's going to force you to, to flip the switch, sooner or later at least. Yes? Thanks. Uh, yeah, so when you flip the switch, how big is the impact on the player engagement, or how much does it drop the player engagement when they stop having uh, not accurate hits, or they're not seeing them, actually? Well, it's hard to say because it's not just one player, right? So it's, it's, um, it, it, de it depends on the distance and the network the player uses till the, till the data center. So you can, you can have stats on, OK, on the, on the tournaments we organize with, with real money prize, the players usually have a very good, uh, a very good uh, network equipment. And they're usually close to, I mean, let's say they're mostly in North America. So if they're close to a data center, the impact is much, much lower. So again, it's, it's, it's based on the network and, uh, and uh, the, data, the distance to the data center. But there is an impact, for sure. How, you, how big it is, you can only check between the, the data from what the server sees and what the client sees. So you can see if it's a two centimeters difference or a one meter difference. Of course, for a one meter difference, you're already considering it's a hack. This was all. OK, thank you very much.